Well, good morning and welcome to the lesson number three on spiritual warfare. Lesson one was kind of an introduction. We talked about the realness of the battle. We also talked about some of the battle statistics, and there are many. We covered just some of them. Many Christians are, are struggling spiritually. They're struggling with Satan have a, having a hold of them. Struggling with being weighted down with sin, habitual sin, addictions of many kinds. They're suffering, and in many, fam many cases, their families are struggling. You Christians. Habitual sin, it gets in the way of a close walk with God. It gets in the way of the blessings associated with a close walk with God. The enemy wants you to think that it's supposed to be this way. After all, you don't deserve anything more. You don't deserve anything better than that, which is a lie. Satan perpetuates lies. John chapter 10 and verse 10 says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. That abundant life is there for us. And it's walking close to God. It's putting God in His place. Satan in his place. In the second lesson, talked about we start talking about the beings that are in the spiritual realm. We start with God Himself. Tried to convey some essence of God's glory. It's, it's hard to do. I don't think we can really comprehend God's glory. I don't think we'll understand it until we see it ourselves. In Revelation chapter twenty-two and verse four says. We'll see his face. We will see his face. Currently in this body, we can't see his face and live. But in that resurrected body that one we will have in heaven in his presence, we will see his face. Now going on talking about what is in this spiritual realm. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Remember that verse? We talked about it a lot. We will continue to. Our struggle, it's not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against people. Our struggle is against angels. Beings that are in the spiritual realm. We're going to talk about that today. We're, it says our struggle is against, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. It's a very dark verse. We're going to talk this morning about Satan. Okay? We're going to talk about Satan. Where did Satan come from? Well, Satan was created by God. God created all things. Satan was created, I believe, well, we're going to look at some passages this morning, created as an angel. He was actually a cherub. We'll, we'll get into that. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 says that the devil has sinned from the beginning. We're going to find that the devil, Satan, had a, had a pride issue. He wasn't satisfied just being an angel. He wanted to be up there with God. If you would, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. We're going to look at a passage in Isaiah, and we're also going to look at a passage in Ezekiel. These are a little bit difficult. Here in Isaiah, it's talking about the king of Babylon. Okay, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 4, it starts talking about, take up this taunt against the king of Babylon, and then, and then it starts this taunt. It's widely believed amongst biblical scholars that this is talking about Satan. Let's, let's read it, and I think, I think you might see one. <clears throat> Babylon is often used as, as, you know, Babylon is who took uh, Judah into, into Babylonian captivity under King Nebuchadnezzar, certainly used as a, 
often as a symbol of enemies of God's people. But verse 12, How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning? Anybody read King James or New King James? No, maybe not. Right here, it tra this word is a Hebrew word, hey, halal. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. Star of the morning. And King James and New King James translates it Lucifer. Lucifer. Which is a Latin translation of the word. You'll only find it King James, New King James, and uh, amongst the mainstream translations. It's Lucifer. Star of the morning. Son of the dawn. You've been cut down to the earth. You who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the earth, of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Mm. Got a little issues here, right? I'm going to make myself like God. You see a problem there? Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. And you could, you could read a lot more there. If you would, turn with me forward a little bit to Ezekiel chapter 28. Now in Ezekiel chapter 28, is to the king of Tyre, the king of T-Y-R-E, like Tyre and Sidon. Widely accepted here that this is also talking about Satan. And I think you'll be able to see why. We'll read verses 11 through 19. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection. When Satan was created, created as an angelic being, had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in the Eden, the garden of God. When I read this, I take it perhaps before he uh, came to Eve as a serpent. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, and the diamond. The beryl, the onyx, and the jasper. The lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets, was in you on the day that you were created. They were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers or guards. Cherubs or cherubim seem to be a, kind of the honor guard among the angels <coughs> that were around the throne guarding uh, you remember the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant? That thing that was in the Holy of Holies. Most of the things in the, uh, in the Holy of Holies, also in the Holy Place, were made from acacia wood and overlaid with gold. But the lid of the Ark of the Covenant was not. It was pure gold. A hammered work. So the lid, integral to the lid, was a mercy seat. Right in the center, this is where God himself would come down above the mercy seat. On either side, integral to the lid, was a cherub with wings pointed into the mercy seat. This is what cherubs, cherub would be. Satan was an anointed cherub. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers or guards. I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you're created until righteousness, uh, excuse me, unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence. And you sinned. 
Therefore I've cast you as profane from the mountain of God, from what we would call heaven, in the presence of God. And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Notice here, Satan was, let's say, full of himself, okay? All right? He has some pride problems. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you. And I've turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. All who know you, all who know you, among the peoples are appalled at you. You have become terrified, literally terrors. And you will be no more. Okay? It's a future state. You will be no more. When we get to... Uh, in Revelation, we see this big battle going on, forces of good and evil. And of course, in the end, we know that Satan is defeated. In chapter 20 and verse 10, Satan meets his end. He's thrown, he's thrown into the lake of fire. Okay? Let's go to the New Testament. Go to Luke chapter 10. The context in Luke chapter 10, Jesus has sent out... Uh, disciples. He sent out uh, at the beginning of chapter 10 there's 70 who are sent out. And he gives them powers to do miraculous things. He gives them powers over unclean spirits. In verse 17 they've come back and they're reporting back to Jesus. Verse 17. The 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Jesus said to them, almost with a smile, but, but Jesus said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now, I don't know if this is literal or if this is figurative, but here you have the disciples of Jesus having power over the followers of Satan. Jesus, yeah, I saw Satan falling from heaven. Well, that's pretty cool. All right, if you would go with me to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to read quite a bit there. Okay. In the last lesson, I talked about uh, the throne scene. When we're talking about the glory of God, throne scene in chapter 4. And then following chapter 5 about Jesus and the magnificence and how the, the heavenly beings Four living creatures, the elders, all the angels falling down and worshiping. It's like all this pageantry that you have as the curtain opens, if you will. Well, in chapter 12 starts what I would call Act number two. Okay? The curtain opens, and we're going to introduce us to some new characters. Now, in this chapter, we have a woman who bears a child. I believe it will become obvious that this child is, is Jesus. Okay? And I think, well, the woman then must be Mary. But I think it's 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 not. It's, it's bigger than that. You'll see as we read. I think it's it's God's people. We're teaching Revelation I'm called spiritualized Israel. It's God's people. So you got God's people, you got the child, and then they were introduced to a red dragon. And it leaves no fuzz on the peach here, if you will. It tells us who the red dragon is. It tells us it's the devil, the serpent of old. Okay? Keep in mind, there's this pageantry. Satan is not actually a red dragon. You know, the pictures of Satan, where you see this red character with horns and a pointy tail. I will see later, Satan actually disguises himself as an angel of light. But in this pageantry, Satan is a red dragon. So let's read some here in chapter 12. We're going to learn some about battles in heaven, we're going to learn about Satan and what he is 
trying to do. Verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. What is that? Stars of heaven were, were angels. You can go back and read in chapter 1 at the end, at least verse 20. Uh, there were lampstands of the seven churches and there, were st and there were stars. It tells us the stars were the angels. Okay? We're about to read about this epic battle. Evidently, uh, Satan and his rebellion, other angels rebelled as well, and they fought against Michael and his angels, which we're about to uh, read. Now, many will take this as a literally a third of the angels fell. I, I tend to think the one third is figurative, but either way, a bunch of angels went with Satan. Verse 4, the red dragon, whose tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. In other words, Satan does not want Jesus to be successful, right? She gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she might be nourished for 1,260 days. Or it's three and a half years. It's half of seven, a partial amount of time. Verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels. And Michael was an archangel. So these are the good angels. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels waged war. They weren't strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with them. Many believe, and I, I tend to believe, these other angels are, are demons. What we call demons. We will probably get into that next week. For the sake of time, you might want to read the rest. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip down to the last verse of uh, Revelation 12. So the dragon was not successful in, in devouring the child. He was not successful in defeating Christ. Okay? We know that. Verse 17, the dragon was enraged. Satan's enraged with the woman. He's the woman, God's people. The dragon is enraged with God's people. He went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. Thus, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony <coughs> of Jesus. Okay? We are at war with the dragon. We are at war with Satan. Now while Satan and the other angels had free choice, just like we have free choice, evidently the angels did too. Many of them decided to rebel against God and against his authority. Well, while they had that choice, God is in complete control of the consequences of those choices. Satan, Satan we read in, uh, no, if indeed, those passages in Isaiah and Ezekiel that we read, that we read, uh, he wanted glory for himself. He wanted to be exalted. He wanted to be like God. First Peter chapter four and verse eleven talks about where the glory belongs. It says, "Whoever speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances of God." Whoever serves, let him do so as by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory 
and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Again, yeah, that's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. If you'd like to turn with me to Acts chapter 12, we're going to read about a situation where the individual involved did not give glory to God. How important is that to God that he get the glory? It, it, it is important. Acts chapter 12 and verse 20. We've got King Herod. Acts chapter 12 and verse 20. Now he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. This is King Herod was angry with him. And with one accord they came to him, and having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace, because their country was fed by the king's country. And on an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal peril, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. Okay? And the people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. It appears Herod really liked that. Verse 23. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and died. <laughs> that would have been a scene to see. At least us guys would probably grill like, I don't want to see that. And guys like, I'd like to see that. Eat, eaten by worms and died, or literally it says he breathed his last. Why? Puffed himself up. Didn't give God the glory. A particularly important part of this spiritual battle that we're talking about in these, in these series is to have a heart that desires to give God the glory. Take ourselves off the throne. It's not about me. And give God the glory. Easier said than done. It's not human nature to take self off the throne. All right. More on Satan. Um... In Matthew chapter 13, you got the parable of the tares and then the explanation of the parable of the tares. In three places there, in verses 19, 38, and 39, Jesus calls him the evil one. Okay, not surprising. Satan's called the evil one. We've already talked about 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 says he sinned from the beginning. By the way, if anybody wants a copy of my notes, I'm happy to send it to you. Just send me an email saying you would like it. <clears throat> John chapter 8, verse 44, talking to the Pharisees, he says, you're like your father, the devil. He was a murderer. Lies. His very nature is to lie. And then he's the <laughs> father of lies. When Satan speaks, what comes out? A lie. Remember that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14 says he disguises himself as an angel of light. He doesn't come out and say, look, I'm the devil. Would you like to follow me? Mm. The very next verse, 2 Corinthians 11 15, says his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Okay? The demons don't come out and say, look, I'm a demon. You want to follow me? Disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 says he's the God of this world. Ephesians 2, 2, the prince of the power of the air. He has a lot of power and authority in this world. Cast out of heaven, cast down to this world. <clears throat> Most of us are familiar with 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Prowls like a roaring lion. That verse starts off, says, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Satan would have us believe that there's no reason to be on the alert. Don't worry, be happy. Don't, you don't need to be on alert. But be of sober spirit. Be on the alert for your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. 
Well, you might, well, who, you watch shows, you know, National Geographic or whatever, you know, you, here's the lions, they're on the prowl. Who do they go after? They go after the weak one, the one that's going to be the easiest to catch, kill, and eat. That's the analogy used. You might think, well, you know, when you're down and out, and you're at your weakest, it wouldn't really be fair for him to come after you. He didn't care anything about fair, okay? He is wicked, he is evil, and he's coming. We have to be ready. He has, he preys upon the weak and has no mercy. Some chief points about Satan. He is limited in his power. James chapter 4 and verse 7 says, resist him and flee. He's already been judged. He's already been condemned. His outcome is certain. The victory of Christ is the defeat of Satan. But for right now, he's here to take as many of us with him as he can. And even if he can't do that, he wants us to be as miserable as possible. He wants us to not be close to God. He wants us to not give glory to God. Some of Satan's strategy. He uses subtle means to get us to rebel against God and his authority. There's no big sign that says this is evil. He pulls you in slowly. After all, everyone else does it, which is another one of his lies. Get you to question God's authority and his word. If you would turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. As Genesis chapter 3 begins, we've got Satan as the serpent approaching Eve regarding the fruit that she's not supposed to eat. First five verses of Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. Of course, Satan knows exactly what God said. Verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. Now, Look at how Satan works this. This is his strategy. Verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die. Okay. Question God's authority. Question his word. You might say, oh, bull corn. Okay. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be what he said. Then he goes on. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Okay? Lies. Deception. Question God's authority and his position. You eat of this fruit, well, you're going to be like him. Well, you won't die. Lies, deceit. Question what God said. Question his position. Question his word. It's exactly what he wants us to do. Probably many other places we could go in the Bible where, where Satan does this. This morning I've just got one other. First Chronicles chapter 21. This is where verse 1 says, Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David, King David, to number Israel. Okay? So he had him. Go count how many how many people do I have to go to war with? Okay. Notice that Satan moved David to do this. What was he doing? It doesn't exactly say. I suspect it's something along the lines of, you know what? You need to get this figured out. You got enemies all around you. You need to figure out how many soldiers you got to make sure that you can get this done. 
That's a little bit of supposition on my part, okay? Because it doesn't exactly say this was not. So David, he did it. He talks to Joab and has Joab, the commander, go, go handle this. Joab is not happy to do it. In fact, if you read the text, you'll find he reports back. He doesn't even include uh, the numbers from Levi or Benjamin because he's not a head camper about what David was having him do. This was not pleasing to God, not one bit. We find in uh, verse 7 it was displeasing, displeasing to God. God actually comes to David and gives him an option of three <coughs> things, punishment. David accepts what he considers to be the, the lesser of the three. But the result is an angel of the Lord kills 70,000 men in Israel. Satan got David the question, God. God had been the one who, who provided victory against the enemies. Told him, I go before you. I give you the victory. But Satan has put it in his heart to think something else. I need to count. See how many told you like that. God not pleased. Satan will tempt you with things that appeal to the flesh. I mean, we can all relate to that, can we not? He uses lies and deceit to do it. That's his way. We need to learn to tell him no. Okay? Resist the devil and he'll flee. Because we belong to the king. We need to learn to look at the devil and say, shoot. As opposed to, oh, I like that. Yeah. Let me indulge in that thing. We will talk a lot about that. It pulls you in deeper and deeper addictions. We talked about some of those addictions in lesson one. Last thing we'll cover this morning is James chapter one, verses fourteen through sixteen. In James chapter one, each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived it gives birth to sin. When sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Satan, the devil, forces of wickedness are all about deception and lies. We can spend a lot of time talking about these verses in James 1. When we're tempted... We need to resist. Then when that's carried away, enticed by lust. Then that lust conceives, gives birth to sin, and sin to death. We'll go back to a scripture I already, we already talked about this morning, John chapter 10 and verse 10. We just got to be talking about Satan. I don't want to give Satan any glory. Satan is evil. He's evil to the core. He rebelled against God himself. He wanted to share the throne with God, evidently. He rebelled against him, fought in heaven. God kicked him out. John chapter 10 and verse 10, our Savior Jesus talking. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. So let's not invite him in. Let's not let him have his way. Because then Jesus says, but I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Is that not what we want for ourselves, for our children, for all of our loved ones? Yeah. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the sanctifying power. Father, thank you for the divinely powerful weapons that we're going to talk about later in this series. Thank you for delivering us from the domain of darkness, transferring us to the kingdom of your beloved Son, in whom there is redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Father, help us to have hearts that want to take ourselves off the throne and put you on the throne. Father, help us to have strength to resist in the evil day, to tell that you want to go away, to resist him that he'll flee and help us to draw near to you and you to us. 
Father, we pray these things with thanksgiving, and we pray them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.